going back four decades to the early 70s and uh, there were a group of um, scientists um, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and they had come up with uh, a brand new way of doing some computer modeling, system dynamics, and uh, when they showed this to a group of essentially wealthy industrialists who were concerned about the way the world was growing and poverty and environmental impacts, um, they, they formed themselves, the, the wealthy industrials formed uh, the Club of Rome and sponsored these scientists to do more computer modelling of what might happen over the coming century essentially. So um, uh, the team was headed up by Dennis Meadows but there were um, a number of uh, bright young scientists working on the project. They gathered data about um, various parts of the world system, so population, uh, resources like uh, energy fuels such as oil, um, the agricultural system, so how, where we get our food from, uh, the industrial system, all about the machinery and capital that goes into supporting the economy, but also the goods we get. And then kind of finally the uh, sort of pollution um, outputs of the whole uh, economic system. And all of those sort of subsystems are tied together, related to one another. Um, and their computer model embodied all of that. And, and they were able to take data from essentially 1900 to uh, 1970 and, f and feed that into the model so it reproduced that historical past, if you like. <coughs> And then, and then use that to run a series of scenarios uh, out to the end of this century, out to 2100, and look at what if we kept going the way we were normally doing things, business as usual if you like, and then what would happen if we were to try and uh, use better technology, say, or change our uh, sort of social and economic policies, if you like. And <coughs> what they found uh, in just doing the business as usual case, so if we had sort of very typical policies um, and behaviour, family sizes were unconstrained, uh, we were continuing to consume more as we became wealthy, but at the same time there might be increasing efficiencies and able to find more resources, those sort of continuing trends, then that business as usual so showed that growth did continue to take place for a number of decades, uh, but ultimately there was what they called a point where we entered overshoot, we had used up more resources from the earth or polluted more of them uh, and then subsequently we, we collapsed. Um, so they had this overshoot and collapse situation occurring in their model. And then of course they, tr they then tried to explore well, what if we had even better technology, more recycling, more efficiency, finding more resources and so on. And while it tended, each intervention tended to solve one particular problem, it caused another. It's a little bit like having a balloon and not wanting it to expand even more. So, so holding it in, in in one direction and solving things apparently in that direction, but then it expanding out in another. And as they sort of put more of these clamps on in a way, it just allowed us the system to grow further into the overshoot of the natural resources and, um, and then lead to, again, collapse. So they found through these scenarios technology itself wasn't enough to avert this collapse. Um, and what was actually, through more experimentation in the model, what was actually needed
was to use the technology but in combination with policies for reducing our material consumption essentially and uh, making sure that we limited family size um, and so forth and, uh, and by doing this combination of quite significant changes they were able to uh, stabilise the, the world population and stabilise our consumption of material things and so on and, and actually have a sort of sustainable planet. Um, basically at the time when the book came out, 1972, it met almost immediately with a lot of criticism from uh, economists essentially who were promoting very strongly the idea of growth and that we could continue to grow. And so the limits to growth work seemed to just completely undermine uh, that agenda. And so the critics uh, essentially uh, looked for ways in which they could try to <coughs> discredit the work. And they did that essentially in a way really by either completely misunderstanding it or they were telling outright lies. And um, one of the myths that came about through this, the criticisms was that um, the, the book was forecasting that we would collapse, world, the world economy would, would start falling apart and population would start falling uh, easily by the year 2000 and, and, um, and, and because clearly that hasn't happened as such um, as we approached the year 2000 and, and people were saying well look we're still growing, it, it seemed to support the, the critics claim that the book got it wrong, the limits to growth modelling was wrong, we were still growing, they predicted we would collapse uh, well in the 19th century, <clears throat> whereas that wasn't the case at all. The book had never forecast a collapse in the 20th century and, um, uh, and, and it was when I discovered um, that on, on reading it uh, one weekend um, uh, that I, I realised, well, first of all, that the critics were, were wrong, but suddenly it dawned on me, yes, we had had all of this growth, but the scenarios in their book were also showing the same sort of growth, and it occurred to me that that was an opportunity to look for real world data and see how it aligned um, with the various scenarios out of their model. Um, but I, I guess the, the first criticism, that the market will solve it, is kind of one, I, I think they, they angled that to the limits to growth by saying, well, you don't have prices in the model, and hence you're not actually reflecting the market dynamics. Uh, but in a way, it, prices are really the communicator of you know, how much we want something, how much is something available. And, and essentially the, the model had that dynamic in there, even if prices per se weren't in there. So as our material wealth uh, on average started to, to go up in the model, there was the uh, empirical, empirically based behaviour that we would um, uh, you know, have seek better services, um, we would uh, change our family size, so not have as many as many children, and so the the overall effect of market dynamics was actually still embodied in the modelling, even though prices per se weren't. Of course, the other side, the the, the criticism um, you mentioned was about, uh, you know, well, technology will save us, and it often seems to me that these debates about our environment, our future and an you know, environmental future come down to uh, almost a blind faith in, in technology. Um, and and I, I should say that by background I'm a technologist, I come from an applied physics background uh, 
so you know I I like what technology does for us but we have to be really careful about putting so much faith in this factor and um, uh, and, and I, I think the the scientists who did Meadows and, and his team who did the modeling work also had a great deal of belief in, in technology and they did actually have that uh, in the model. In the early versions for the original publication in 1972 uh, they would kind of turn technology up themselves, they would ramp up uh, recovery rates and recycling rates and um, pollution uh, control mechanisms. They would turn that up in the model themselves. So that technology was actually in there even though the critics said it wasn't. Um, and then in subsequent versions they made that even uh, more sophisticated by actually introducing a mechanism within the model itself. So if if the computer numbers were showing that some problem was getting worse, such as a growing global pollution, then there was a response built into the model that uh, pollution control technologies would start increasing and so on. So they had adaptive technology, which kind of embodies the two concepts of technology and a marketplace recognizing something going wrong, perhaps. Uh, but what was really interesting, so the critics also ignored that fact, that it was actually in there as well. Um, but if you study the role of technology in the model, as they did, um, played around with various scenarios for that, they found that you, you had to have really un bizarre levels of technological advancement in order to actually allow the world system to continue growing essentially indefinitely. You, you had to have growth rates of innovation of something like 5% per year and, and we're lucky if we you know, ever, we kind of get 1% per annum if you're sort of optimistic about technological progress. So 5% per annum, a five-fold increase um, as well as having absolutely no delay for when you detect a problem to when you can put the technology into place. And that's obviously not true either, you know, you have universities and so on working on recognising an issue, getting it raised, then getting interest and funds to work on the solution to the problem. It's 10, 20 years before you even start seeing new technology entering the marketplace as such to try and avert the problem. So it was this, primarily this issue with delay, you had a, a signal from the environment, say population or resources running down, but by the time that got to a bad state you couldn't develop enough technology fast enough to, to ever solve the problem. And there's then even, uh, this is probably a third uh, aspect to the market and technological angle and that is when we just operate our economic system in sort of business as usual technology is actually part of the problem. This is a bit of a weird uh, perspective on it but it makes more sense, it makes a lot of sense when you just unpack it a little bit and that is we tend to think that if we just become more efficient, more productive in the workplace, we'll, be, we'll save resources and we'll pollute less. But what happens is, if we did nothing else, if we were more efficient, more productive, we would then need less people in the workplace to make cars and to sell books at bookshops and so forth. The end result is, if you if you did nothing else but be more efficient, you would then have mass unemployment in our typical economic system. And that, of course, would be social unrest, lead to social unrest. So the growth paradigm actually came about through saying, <clears throat> let's convince people through a number of mechanisms to consume more and more, and hence actually create a stimulus 
for uh, creating jobs for those people that had been put out of jobs by the efficiency gains. And so that's kind of why technology is a bit of a double-edged sword. It depends on sort of how we uh, use it or embody it in, in our social and economic systems. Um, and unfortunately in our normal way, the, the, you know, the growth just means that we, uh, we consume more, create more jobs, okay, that's good, but we've then effectively used up more resources and created more pollution. And then ironically, uh, offset the gains we thought we were going to get from the efficiency. So there's, it's almost like there's a number of different scales that you can think of the rebound effect occurring on. So if, if our heating systems in our homes become more efficient and we're feeling good about that because we're thinking we're not using as much coal or electricity and therefore as much coal um, in heating or cooling our homes, uh, that, that's the good side. Then, along with that, we also think it's good because uh, often those systems are cheaper. The, the, the use of uh, our energy has gone down, so we're paying less in electricity bills. Um, and so, on a, on a very small scale, part of the rebound effect is that uh, people then might be encouraged to actually cool their houses more just simply leave the system on while they're actually not in the house so they can come back to a cool home at the end of a hot working day. Um, of course there is a limit to that. Even though your heating and cooling in this example might get cheaper and cheaper, you don't keep turning the heat up or the cooling up in your home indefinitely. So yes, then there might be a, another saving to the wallet, to the bank account. In which case, the rebound effect could take um, effect on a different scale. You've now got money that you didn't have before to go and take an international holiday or buy a new car. Um, and hence, once again, we're using up resources and polluting more. And then the ultimate level of the rebound effect is this one on a, uh, a whole economy scale of um, becoming more efficient, having more money, uh, having more money but not necessarily having a job unless we're all encouraged to consume, buy more, um, unless the industry works out ways, uh, which they have very well, of making sure that things become obsolete, planned obsolescence and they break down uh, in a very short period of time so then you have to go out and buy the new washing machine or uh, turn your iPhone over um, on a yearly basis or um, something like that. There's those mechanisms to encourage us to, to buy and consume more things. And so that's the rebound effect on, on a much bigger scale. <laughs> I realised that, that there was this um, growth was forecast in their modelling and uh, to, uh, to the year, about the year 2000 and, and, um, and that's when I really started to take a look at the limits to growth and realised that, well at that time there had been three decades of real world progress and data out there on which to compare to the model. And I've since updated that, so we now have 40 years of comparison. And I went about collecting publicly available data, and essentially in the, on the five main areas of their, their modelling, uh, on population, birth rates, death rates, but essentially the population trajectory, on uh, food production, so we could compare to the food per capita in the model, on uh, industrial output, um, uh, which uh, there are some good numbers through the UN, actually a lot of this data comes through the UN bodies but not all of it, 
Um, so that gets us industrial output or sort of material production and, uh, and, and creation of machinery and so on. Uh, uh, then also resources. So I um, looked into published material on what were the understandings of the original amount of resource minerals in the earth and I, I actually took a very um, uh, optimistic stance by saying probably if you are clever you can probably substitute a lot of metals for each other a lot of those sort of minerals um, so let's consider them to be infinite in a way and essentially come back to looking at resources come down to energy resources fossil fuels in the ground uh, so oil, gas, coal, and I found a range of numbers that could give me an upper and lower limit on, if we were very optimistic, what was the upper limit of res original resources and what was the lower. And then going to um, companies like BP who publish how much uh, fossil fuels we have consumed. So you can subtract one that from the original resource and see how much we've got left. And then finally, uh, in the pollution side, looking um, very suitable numbers come from uh, the greenhouse emissions area and climate change of carbon dioxide levels um, in the atmosphere. And so that data gave me enough to basically overlay onto the limits to growth modelling and I did that for three of their key scenarios, the business as usual scenario, and then another one which they called comprehensive technology, where they just threw all these technological advances into the world system, into the model. And then the third one where they used technology but then also had uh, changed behavior, less material consumption, smaller families and so on, um, to establish a stabilised world. And what I found was that that stabilised world scenario and the comprehensive technology scenario did not align well at all with the data now over 40 years. But what did align surprisingly well was the business as usual scenario and um, and that shows a lot of growth but it also shows at about this time a sort of a, a peaking in some things a, a saturating a turning over of trends particularly in the area of industrial output per capita so it grew very well up till about the year 2000 and then the growth rate slowed down and in the model started to flatten out and that in, indeed is what is happening in the real world and showed up in the data. Uh, that also kind of sparked a follow on question um, about could it be that the, the GFC were essentially still trying to get ourselves out of the global financial crisis, um, which is still kind of plaguing the world in a way. Could it be that that was actually, is a manifestation of this peaking uh, in, in the business as usual trajectory in the, in the modeling? And um, on the face of it, you wouldn't think so because it, you know, by the very name, the global financial crisis, it sounds like it's something to do with, with money. But actually there may be a connection to a much more physical and important part of the world's operation and, and that has to do with the availability of oil. And it's quite likely that the one, the, the peaking in 
uh, in oil production, conventional oil, around about year 2000, give or take, led to price rises in oil, which then everyone felt, particularly um, the people in the US, uh, uh, which everyone felt as, as higher prices, not just for their transport, but it fed through essentially to all the things they buy, food and so on. And that might have been enough to tip uh, a whole lot of people who were on the edge anyway of being able to pay their mortgage and, and they had to default. And so it's the trigger for the coordinated default in, in debt that uh, peak oil might have been. And so um, perhaps there is, uh, perhaps the GFC is something of a manifestation of the, the limits to growth modelling. And in fact, if you, that then kind of led me into looking a bit further into the role of oil. And uh, as we've consumed our conventional supplies of oil, the ones that were uh, typically easy to get out of the ground, you drill a hole, the, the pressure in the oil reserve initially anyway helps to drive oil up. It was a very um, accessible resource initially. But as you get it through about halfway through that resource, it becomes harder and harder to get and you have to work harder to, to push it out of the ground essentially. And so the, the production rate um, starts to, to go down. And at that, subsequently with the price rise in oil, we've been able to uh, uh, exploit much harder resources, deep water oil, uh, shale oil, shale gas. But the thing is, they take an awful lot of effort to get out of the ground. A lot of labour, trucks, machinery and energy itself. So, so we're having to put even more inputs into getting out this critical resource. And it's actually that mechanism that is behind the collapse in the limits to growth modelling. It wasn't that we ran out of resources as such. Uh, more that as the resources got a, a bit scarcer, you had to devote more of industrial output to getting those resources. And so it was a, in a way it was like the industrial system was uh, distracted to getting resources rather than helping support the agricultural system and the service sector. Uh, and, and the population and, and it, in fact even itself so because the industrial system is distracted to getting resources there's not as much um, reinvestment in the industrial system and so the, it starts to decline, it degrades, we don't replace aging power plants and uh, factories as quickly and that is actually the the, the turnover in the model and um, uh, that leads to this collapse phase. Once you get there it's very very hard to stop. Um, it, it's kind of like chasing your tail and you're trying to get more and more difficult, harder to get resources out. You're just devoting more to that and you're spending less time on recreating or managing your industrial system and so things just start to drop, um, output starts to drop very um, quickly in the collapse phase and then that undermines the food system, you no longer can supply machinery, tractors and so on and move food around and supply fertilizers to the food system and that helps to undermine the services and, and that eventually leads to a, a quick fall in uh, population. I guess one of the interesting things is uh, it, it seems that demographers have often, well they, they go about making forecasts of population but it seems that they get it wrong all the time um, because it's essentially based on 
what you think the fertility rate is going to be in the future. How many children per woman or if you like per family will people have and that's something that can change in a way quite readily if you're not thinking about the rest of the system. If you're just doing population modelling as a standalone exercise then it's, it's a free thing that you can just change the fertility rate on some assumptions um, that, that perhaps even fit your political agenda like the recently released intergeneration report um, is being questioned in the very same way were these assumptions about fertility rates and immigration rates actually right? How robust are they into the future? The difference with the limits to growth model is that that demographic working is, is embedded in the rest of the system so that there's a recognition that actually as, as we get wealthier on average uh, typically we have smaller families and so the, the, the system, that's one example of how the system sort of feeds back to controlling a key parameter of demographic models and of course another one would be at the other end of the human lifetime, the mortality rate and that also is linked in the model to say effects of pollution and availability of food and services. So with that sort of background and that difference from just typical standalone demographic models maybe then it's not surprising um, but quite unusual that the limits to growth population forecast is so closely on the money. It's not exact, it has somewhat different rates of, of uh, birth rates and death rates, but the trends are definitely right. Yes, um, so, so we've actually, uh, as we've got wealthy, we've gone through something called the demographic transition, uh, where we were, um, had better services, better health and so on, water systems and so on. So our death rate fell first uh, and, 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 and then that was followed by a falling birth rate. As we got wealthier we just needed, you know, we could have smaller families. Um, and so with that difference in what happens first, de death rates falling faster than initially than birth rates, that means you you still have um, uh, the mechanism for population growth and it's only when those two, the birth rates and death rates, equal each other that you would have a stable population. Um, so in, in the past part of the modelling where we're up to now, uh, the, the death and birth rates have been, have been a part but are sort of approaching each other. Um, but that, so that leads to population growth. But when the overshoot occurs in the model and we're not able to support our food, the food system, we're not able to support services, then those can no longer support the health of the population and so death rates start to climb. Uh, and <clears throat> essentially that leads to population peaking and then falling. It happens a bit later than some of the other uh, uh, peaking and falling. So I think in the business as usual it's about 2030 when population peaks um, and then falls at about half a billion people per decade from, from memory. But there is a caution that although the collapse phase does look dramatic and scary in the modelling. We have to be a little bit cautious about it interpreting that because it, the model is still running on the same uh, interrelationships, the equations about our um, dependency on, on one sector and another are still in the model uh, and so 
that may not be the case in real life, in the real world. If, if we're actually facing a collapse mode, we could have uh, different behaviours coming to the fore that hadn't been there before. And you could imagine it might go sort of two ways. It, it, we could sort of descend into chaos and war and depravity and so on, um, which I suppose a lot of the archaeological evidence would tend to indicate for societies that have collapsed in the past. Or we could have an emergence of a different, uh, a different culture, a different sort of society. And perhaps it's something led by a global leader that comes out of nowhere or perhaps it's a it's a ground up thing that um, people actually want to change want to seek a better life a more sustainable one and and maybe that actually averts the the worst of the modeled collapse <laughs>No, I, I think the short answer is no, uh, an absolute no. I don't think governments are ready at all. Um, and, you know, I think basically there's too many vested interests uh, and too many powerful vested interests in seeing, trying to see the, the, the system continuing the same way. Uh, in fact, I, um, there's some recent uh, research um, by others using a system dynamics model, uh, the same sort of technique as the limits to growth, but a completely different model, looking at this question of uh, do we, are we able to communicate well enough to people and is that enough to actually get a change of behaviour? And, uh, and the, and the modelling sort of if you like, has, has a bunch of people who, uh, say, might vote for a politician. Um, and you could have politicians who are promoting a truth, you know, uh, uh, messages about the way the world really is. And then there may be politicians or others, corporate interests and so on, who uh, essentially uh, employ all sorts of tactics to avoid that truthful message. So tell lies, they uh, create false promises, they create doubt in people and fear and so on. And the crux of it is that that sort of side of, of uh, the pool of, of uh, politicians always influence people more than the, the truthful side. And, and the crux of it is, if you can put it simply this way, you can always tell a bigger lie, but you can't tell a bigger truth. There is just the one truth. And, and so these loops, these dueling loops, are biased towards the, the untruthful one, unfortunately. And it allows those people to win uh, those uh, say, uh, powerful corporations or, or uh, politicians associated with them to, to win lots of voters over um, to their way of thinking until things get so bad that the truth sort of becomes self-evident and then you sort of get a rapid switching over of, of the populace. So some really fascinating modelling uh, that would explain a lot of what we see in political dynamics, that it, it does take a long time until things get really bad and then people uh, you know, get out on the streets and march or form campaigns and so on and, and then you get this sort of revolution taking place. So I, I think I have uh, sort of two, two parts to a response there. One is if if we are looking for a, a, a grassroots, a, a bottom-up approach to this, um, we try to find the most positive way to, to put it and, and um, linking back to what we talked about before in terms of uh, efficiency 
being part of the problem at making people unemployed, well, we could turn that into a, a positive by essentially saying, let's work less. Let's, over time, shorten the work week. And then you don't have any need to actually grow the system. You can still have a really great standard of living, so it's not actually living in austerity, it's not going back to living in caves, which you know critics would, um, would uh, try pointing uh, you know, at this strategy. You would still have technological advancement, um, uh, but you just wouldn't have as many things because your working week would be shorter, you could have more leisure time, but of course you wouldn't have as much income either. So that's a constraining factor uh, inherent in, in the strategy to stopping further consumption. So I, I think that's a part response to, to George Monbiot. It's not necessarily about um, uh, yeah, really, you know, the hair shirt, the struggling, struggling um, about it. It could be quite a nice standard of, of living. Um, and one that, you know, whenever I, I talk to people about um, having a shorter working week and working a little less hard, it usually gets a big round of applause and support. So there's, there's, there's that angle. But I, I think it still is very hard for, um, for trying to create such movements when there's a massive system out there that's all built all predicated on growing and uh, perhaps enhancing further the wealth of very wealthy people, um, which we're seeing, we're seeing inequality grow. But there's some other, so the second part to my response is um, what apparently happens in past societies where there are these sort of resource pressures and environmental pressures and so on. Um, is that if the elites in a society are all unified in, and together and working in co cooperation, they can as effectively quell revolutions and rebellions, and so you don't get societal change. If the pressures get so bad, the environmental resource pressures get so bad, that some of the elites are being challenge themselves, are suffering themselves, then, then they may start to compete among themselves. And it's that stage, evidently in many historical accounts, that rebellions and revolutions, changes occur. So uh, taking that, uh, you know, sort of at, at face value, I would be, for me, I'm looking for signs potentially of that actually happening in our society. Are there some parts of the bureaucratic structure or, or the corporations that are actually starting to uh, uh, change their message from, uh, from the standard and from their, their peers and actually to support ground-based movements, a, a change in the way of life? Yeah, it um, can be a thorny uh, concept to, to pin down, but sometimes I think we, in academic circles, we can get ourselves a bit tied in a knot unnecessarily. Um, so, so collapse really is about uh, a, a fairly rapid, typically a fairly rapid, um, drop in the standards of living in the way that our economy typically functions and and also usually with this a collapse in population um, so uh, more people die at younger ages uh, perhaps that's through lack of health support perhaps it's through wars um, that come about at the time uh, and and so I, I guess the other way to try and understand collapse is to look at past occasions, uh, past times when societies uh, 
um, have gone through collapse. And in a number of cases it is, it is rapid or it can go down for a while and then reach another uh, plateau and, but not solve the inherent problems and then drop again. Uh, and so what, and, and others might take a bit longer to, to fall, but what we do see is an unraveling of our uh, sort of good society, uh, the institutions that hold together um, civilised behaviour. It's very, very hard to actually make any sort of forecast or prediction about if collapse is occurring, what form will it take? Will it be fast and rapid, a complete unravelling, or will it be more drawn out? Um, I, I, perhaps it actually depends more on a curious um, uh, sort of spontaneous events. Uh, maybe you know something someone says starts a movement, or uh, uh, yeah, some you know individual historical events may just occur that perhaps trigger a rapid decline, or perhaps there's a there's people around who exert a calming influence, and and the the collapse is more gradual. I, I suppose I would be prepared for a fairly rapid decline since the world system is so bought into the, the globalised market economy, we're so wedded to that, that it was suggest to me that w when a break comes it might be fairly brittle and might happen quickly. On the other hand, of course we've never been sort of more informed about the world in a way. We have a huge amount of data at our hands and, and knowledge and so on. And perhaps we're, we'd be able to manage things and do the triage to sort of limit the, um, limit the fall, uh, slow it down a bit. Um, so yeah, I could see it happening multiple ways or both ways. I guess what I mean is, uh, I, I, and I should sort of preface this response really by saying I don't necessarily think it's certain that we're in for collapse or that it's happening now. I, I, I think trying to make such a call, a certainty call on this, is would be extremely brave. Um, but I just think the evidence does appear to be assembling and stacking up uh, for the, that, we're, that it's likely that we may even be in the early stages of, of a collapse mode um, right now. Um, and, and if that's the case, if, if the evidence is there, not just through the limits to growth, but through all of this, some of the other modelling we talked about and other people's observations and uh, that we know it's happened to other societies in the past, um, then then surely it makes sense to actually get prepared for that um, rather than, you know, it's, it's kind of like getting the lifeboats ready on the Titanic rather than sitting on the deck chairs listening to the music. Um, uh, it just makes sense to me to, to start to prepare and I, I suppose that, that to me means um, expect, being more self-reliant because if, if collapse does occur, then, um, then you may not be able to depend on electricity to your house all the time uh, and, and water being supplied or clean water being supplied um, or food. I mean, those, those seem to me to be some key um, factors in our living is making sure you've got, got food, water and then you know, energy shelter. Um, so it, it makes sense to me to, to be thinking about at least uh, putting in some simple systems in initially. Just the water tank off the side of the house, maybe uh, 
uh, some solar panels, even if it's not supplying the totality of your household electricity. Um, they would be things that could be done already and very readily, uh, but would provide a bit of a safety net for households. And then I think also um, start growing at least a bit of your own food. Again, even if it's just a simple start, and, and, um, and you can grow a little bit very, very simply. If you need to grow a lot of it, it's actually, it can be quite demanding and challenging. But sprinkle some carrot seeds in the ground or lettuce seeds and, and let them go. And, you know, you've got to start. You, uh, so I think that's about preparing for what may be a likely collapse, though maybe not inevitable. The other side to it is, though, that often, you know, when people start doing these things, they actually enjoy themselves. They find it really fun and, you know, they're, they're typically they're, they're working with other people or neighbours or people in the community, um, spending more time with the family uh, and, and just feeling like they have a greater connection with nature uh, and also this uplifting feeling of, of being self-reliant rather than depending absolutely on the, uh, the centralised area sending water to you and electricity. So I think it, it's also kind of ironically getting prepared for collapse is perhaps also almost a way of avoiding it in a sense that you start to, to move people away from all of these centralised systems which have been good for growth and good in a growth economy and, and bringing things back to the local and getting to know people in the community and so on.